was a lot of great stuff. We have a lot of people here that you're going to want to see. Uh, thank you so much for coming as part of New York Comic Con 2016. Uh, I just want to start on a weird personal note. I hope that's okay. 13 years ago today, I quit drinking. Now, you might call me a quitter, but I did. I made that decision 13 years ago. It was the best decision I ever made. And now, because of that, here I am in Madison Square Garden with the greatest show on television, with the greatest community of fans. So, if you're saying if you're on the fence or you need help, you can turn your life around. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, so, this is, thank you, I love you too. Um, so this is probably the biggest year coming up, the premiere coming up in a couple of weeks. And it's so big, and so anticipated, literally all summer long, people are like, who did Negan kill? And I'm like, I don't know, because I'm a bad liar and you'd get it out of me if I knew. So it's for both of our protection. But this premiere is so big that we are doing Talking Dead live from Hollywood Forever Cemetery for 2,000 fans uh, in a couple of weeks. If you go to TalkingDeadSweeps.com, uh, you can find out maybe how you can come to that. So. October 23rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, Walking Dead. Uh, everyone will be there. Hopefully you guys will be there too, so let's get on with it. I'm gonna bring everyone out now. Have time. Show runner and executive producer, Scott M. Gimbo! legally binding in the state of New York. What are some other things that we will see that... Oh, well, that's not fun. Yeah. So, Father Gabriel, Seth, Seth, I'm sorry, Seth is stuck in traffic. He's on his way. When he gets here, and he's stressed out about it, as anyone would be. So when Seth gets here, lose your freaking minds. Like, just, like, massive standing ovation. Like, really make him feel welcome when he gets here. Because he's gonna, he's gonna run in panting and probably on the verge of vomiting because he's, he doesn't want to be late. So, when Seth Dillon gets here... Besides Negan, what are some of the things that you're excited about this season, Scott? Uh, in putting together these episodes, I will say this season, and, and I'm not saying it just because they're here, I'm saying in spite of the fact that this year, they're here, the performances this year are astounding. Yeah. The actors this year are the star of the show which I know sounds counterintuitive, but Greg does great work. Uh, so uh, yeah, be on the lookout for some amazing performances, uh, some really 
unbelievably creepy, strange, weird walkers. And if you can do that in the seventh year of a, of a show that has walkers, you can hold your head up high. So, and you have a tiger now too. You might have noticed a tiger. Yes. I remember it was a couple of years ago saying to Kirkman, like, how you've seen so much year over year. What is it about season seven that is most exciting? I mean, we could be here all night with me answering that question. I don't question. think my people would mind that. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I think the first thing is we've, it really is a larger world. It's a, it's a new, there are new worlds we're going to be exploring with new characters. Uh, obviously, Ezekiel and Shiva being two of them. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we've had it, even though the show has been a big show, it's essentially been contained. You know, we've, we had the Atlanta season, we had the farm season, we you know, had the prison, you know, Woodbury, you name it. Well, now we have almost, we have a Walking Dead universe, thanks to Mr. Kirkman. Um, and because Rick was making a lot of really Seth, how's it going? Oh, welcome, welcome. Uh, should, we all right. start, should we start over now? Let's yeah, start. we got everyone go back out. We'll reintroduce First everybody and come back out. Um, you saw uh, Andy Lincoln in the video. Unfortunately, Andy could not be here, but I believe he sent a message through Norman. Uh, is this true, Norman Reedus? <laughs> <laughs> Dear New York Comic Con. No, do the soft British accent. <laughs> no. um, this is Andrew Lincoln here. I have occupied Norman Reedus for the next few minutes. I am inside his mind. I am truly sorry not to be with you all today, but to make up for it, Normski has promised to read word for word this message on my behalf. <laughs> here we go. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to Andrew Lincoln for all the pain and humiliation I've caused him over the years. The chicken in his trailer was juvenile. The ongoing glitter war was ill-judged. And consistently not knowing any new characters' names or plot lines that Daryl Dixon doesn't happen to be in is quite simply unprofessional. I admire him deeply. I secretly wish I was him. When he's not here, I miss him. I really do. Don't skip this beat. I'll know if you do because Stephen has a copy of this message. He, he, he's a remarkable man. You better say this, Stephen, because Cudlitz has a hot copy of this message as well. Uh, true saint. True saint. Who needs their glasses now? Keep going with the speech quick because Mike will probably say something shitty. I thought it would be nice to do something with the fans to, to make up for my absence. So Normski will ask a question and the first person to get it right gets to choose any item of clothing he is currently wearing. <laughs> All right, the question is this. How many squirrels did Daryl Dixon throw at Rick when I told him I handcuffed Merle to the rooftop? 13! Good luck, have a great night, and I hope you're wearing boxers normally. <laughs> and so, watching you and Andy play, play jokes on each other, is that how you kind of keep it light because of how depressing uh, some of the subject matter is? Yeah, kind of, I mean, we've, we've always sort of screwed with each other, but um, he's gonna do, I mean, the last, the last thing that happened, he put my motorcycle out on a boat and pushed it out to the middle of a lake. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, Negan Cummings was maybe one of the best comic book villains of all time, right? So we're seeing someone who has a great history from the comic be adapted onto the screen. <coughs> Negan really is the sign of the new world. You know, as uh, Storman was saying, they thought that they could take him, they thought that they had it, they thought that they were the baddest people out there, and they run into somebody that is uh, bigger, stronger, uh, more organized, better equipped. I mean, they are sort of outnumbered, outgunned. There, there's, there seemingly is very, very little hope for our characters to come out with, but Negan really sort of wields that power in a way that seems perfectly suited for the 
apocalypse. I want to. But, but this character, I mean, this is this unlike anything you've experienced before coming onto this show? Yeah, it's not even close. This is a whole. I mean, the show hasn't even aired yet. We had a little bit, 13 minutes and 16 last year, but this and what's about to happen it's already nuts and we haven't started the year yet yeah you know no i've never seen nothing close because from <laughs> from negan's point <laughs> it's creepy uh, <laughs> it, from negan's point of view i mean do you think do you think he's a, a bad guy from his point of view this kind of snotty arrogant group is running around killing his people yeah. Yeah. But do you, you are you are such a Negan apologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so am I. I like Chris a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you must actually, as the performer, you must understand him, and you must think he's making choices for good reason. He must believe he's good, right? Do you do you yeah, see him as a good character? Or I a bad think character? I think in order to approach a character like Negan and to have somewhere to go, you have to believe in what you're doing, and what he is doing is. Essentially the same thing these guys have been doing for the last seven years. He, he just happens to carry a baseball bat that he loves dearly. Um, but yeah, I think he absolutely thinks he's right, but he's also, as we know, a bit of a showman. This world is his stage, and, and he owns it. And uh, you know, you can call it cocky, but we've watched Rick and these guys kind of get cocky in the last seven years, I think especially last year. So I think Negan coming in and flexing his Barnum and Bailey style <laughs> justice on these people uh, is kind of his way of letting them know that they were wrong and they, it's time to go down and not sure ten. What do you think it is now? And <laughs> you know, you guys were the, the sort of the central force of hope in the show that a relationship can thrive, you know, no matter what's going on. If you're separated, when you're together, when you have to go out and fight. But now people, other people on the show are coupling up and they're, they're, there's real relationships forming. So is it, you know, is a relationship in this world, um, is it an asset or is it a liability sometimes? Um, Glenn and Maggie are, uh, they're classic. You know what I mean? That's, that's good. That's good. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think traditionally, if you were to look at the circumstances, you could argue that having someone is a danger. Um, but I think what Glenn and Maggie have is they're kind of together, they're even better and they're greater. Um, and you see that. You see the strength in Maggie, you see the strength in Glenn, you see uh, the, 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 the leaps and bounds they're willing to traverse to get back to each other, to get back to that team. And I think, uh, yeah, you could argue that one way, but personally for me, I think they're badass together. Next question is for Seth. Hey, how's it going, Seth? Hey, it's all right. How you doing? Um, so Gabriel, there was, there was a... such a beautiful character because you know when you see her in the beginning what she's living through she basically she's such a survivor she's such an amazingly strong character and she adapts watching her adapt and okay now I'm in this situation I have to give everyone cookies and put this sweater on now I gotta go kill people so I'm gonna give kids knives I mean she's she knows how to work every single situation so what has been what has been your favorite part of her from going back to season one, what what is it about Carol that you really love the most? I think everything that you just said, adapting, changing, getting stronger. Um, I love Jimmy the Love this group so much, leaving the group. I love that she left them. I don't know why I love that she left them because she loved them so much. 
you know, I, I just, I just love this character. <laughs> I appreciate her a lot, and especially with this show, is that, you know, yeah, they could have just turned her into a character like, okay, she's just a killing machine now. But when you guys really had a, f a few moments to take a breath in Alexander and she started processing all of these kills, it really shook her. And so she is, she's so human now, and not, you know, she's not just one tone of a character. So where do you think she's at emotionally at the end of last season? I think every every step she's taken up to this moment has just devastated her to this point. She needs she just needs to get her head together and understand and have try to find some sense in how it is that what we have to do is so monstrous in order to survive and we're becoming the monsters that we're trying to protect ourselves from. Just to make sense of it, to say this is the way it is. If you want to survive, and now to what end? And what is it about this world that makes us want to survive so much? That's a huge question, and it's a cool question. I love that question. <laughs> I used to think Talking Dead was therapy for Walking Dead, and then I realized I'm actually Walking Dead customer service. Like that's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> so tweet at me, Lauren Cohan. Uh, <laughs> Maggie, Maggie is, as the last green, has become, she's such a, she's really become a leader. She's really become such a strong character. And I'm, I'm so, I would so love to know how she would be dealing with the situation differently because she was in such rough shape going into the end of last season. How do you think she would have dealt with things differently if she had been completely healthy? Hearing 99, I'm in such rough shape right now. I'm like. You guys have all been on such a huge journey with us. I'm like... <laughs> thank you. And thank you for caring about our show and for being mad when you don't know things and for... I mean, uh, like... I love you too. Thank you. I mean, when Melissa said, oh, what did you say? I don't know. Everything Melissa said, I just like, I don't remember your question, Chris. I just, I'm so, like, this, this is, no, this is larger than our lives. This is larger than our show. This is like, such a privilege. Exactly. Such a great thing. We're so grateful to be Because, you know, these people are here because you guys are so committed to what you do. You know, you guys... And, and I think the thing that's, that, that sets the show apart from so many other shows is that you guys legitimately give a shit. Like, you care as much about this show and this fandom and this universe as these people here. Like, you're fans of the thing you're working on. And so it's... You know, it's special to me and everyone here that you show up and they love that you... I mean, you know, I don't think anyone wants you to ever feel sad, but to see that it means this much to you is like, a, it's a really big deal to these fans and to everyone. Uh, so, it just, I know you guys work in a bubble and you're, you know, you're in rural Georgia shooting for most of the year and you kind of don't know what's going on in the outside world, but, you know, this is the result of your passion and everything that you guys are doing. It's making this many people happy uh, every week, so, and sometimes devastated, but it's because they care, and it's funny that you say like, yeah, get mad when you don't know about stuff, that means you guys are passionate, that's important, if people didn't care, they were like, I don't give a shit, well that's, you don't want that, you know, like, you want people to give a shit in either direction, but my, my, qu yeah, <laughs> like that guy in the back, give all your shit, <laughs>
But my question, my question was, how do you think Maggie would be handling this particular situation differently if she had been healthy and not, you know, completely about to fall over? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we were pretty incapacitated because we knew somebody was going to be hurt if we rebelled and reacted. And I mean, it takes everything in anybody's power to not get up and just headbutt that guy over there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. You know, I love you, Jeff. I love you too. Just kidding. Not kidding about the love. Uh, yeah, how would she? I, I can never say how she would have handled it differently. I don't know. It was just, I think that's what's so rare about this episode and what's so rare about what this propels everyone into because it's so unexpected, jarring, and destabilizing in a bigger way than we've ever had. I mean, the story that comes from. This year is like, it's insane. Yeah, I mean, we were completely just knocked up our feet, literally, to the ground. So I, we will see how, how that, um, how people deal with what they could and should and would have done as we go through. Well, no matter what happens and no matter who it is, and I legitimately don't know.